With Brexit, the United Kingdom will be leaving the European Union. This means that the City of London, which is Europe's largest hub for capital markets, non-bank capital and funds management, will be firmer outside the EU's regulatory purview. Could you outline the impact that this change will have on one side on the policy of the EU27 and on the other on the European business and economic growth? Sure. I think uh, one thing to bear in mind is that um, the EU is the most important customer of financial exports for London. So there is a very strong connection between the City of London and EU and the EU capital markets. It, imposes, it poses a very significant set of questions, I believe, because of the way in which the EU27, after Brexit, will have to manage uh, their capital markets activities. Firstly, not only in the light of some uh, moves within the United Kingdom to take the opportunity of Brexit to develop a regulatory light regime uh, in, in, in the UK. Secondly, whether in response to this regulatory light regime and the fact that there is the largest offshore, that the largest market in the EU is offshore, whether the EU should pursue an inward looking, somewhat protective strategy, or thirdly, whether it should actually take the opportunity to open up the single market and seek a deeper integration with the global capital markets, including, interestingly enough, the UK. The bottom line, however, is that after Brexit, at least for the foreseeable future, the EU will be in a somewhat uncomfortable position of having no regulatory control over the financial market that its economy relies on to do much of its business and its access to, to global financial markets. Now, the impact in terms of the European business is that uh, much of the funding of European business is done through bank finance anyway. And I believe that post-Brexit that dependence will increase by virtue of the fact that the international capital market will now be outside of the EU uh, and the EU27 dependence on bank financing will perforce, perforce increase uh, a bit. Indeed. And uh, speaking about the financial institutions which are nowadays based in London, um, how are they practically preparing for Brexit? Well, interestingly enough, and I think that the, the, the referendum in 2016 was as big a shock to the financial markets in the City of London as it was to the EU. But I think with almost straight away, many within the finance industry quickly developed contingency plans driven by the uncertainties that arose from the, uh, what the final Brexit deal would be about. And the assumption from the outset has been that there will be a hard Brexit. Now, why is that assumption in place? It's firstly because uh, after two years, and of course that's now been extended, so we still haven't got the final Brexit, but the fact of the matter is that the EU treaties will uh, cease to apply to the UK and that it would become a third country outside of the EU market and it would therefore no longer benefit from the free movement of good capital and services under, under the EU single market. And secondly, that after day one of Brexit, the EU, the, the UK will not have the equivalent status. In other words, it will not be able to continue its trading activities and it will not have negotiated a bilateral agreements with individual member states. And what that means is that the UK-based financial institutions will lose their passporting rights as long as they stay within the EU. And that is the key to being able to have ongoing trading and asset management relationships and access by the City of London to the EU. And talking about now on about the EU institutions, are they consciously uncoupling London as a potential offshore financial competitor and contributing on the other side to the relocation of financial services across the EU? Yeah, I think, I think what uh, seems to be the case is that as the uh, UK institutions in the immediate aftermath of the referendum swarmed over Europe trying to establish uh, uh, subsidiaries and, 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 and banks in the EU to maintain that access, it became very clear pretty much from the outset uh, that there were going to be some very strict rules in terms of being able to participate in the EU. For example, uh, the, uh, there was going to be no brass plating 
Uh, you need to, as a UK financial institution, if you move into Europe, you need to have mind and management, a governance infrastructure, a processes and procedures, you need to have a control framework in place, and a business plan. And uh, you need to make sure that what activity you're dealing with in terms of your uh, European clients is actually dealt with within Europe, not out of London. And I think that's particularly important in terms of somewhat ring-fencing the activities that um, have migrated from London into the EU. At the same time, I think the uh, EU has taken the view that, particularly in terms of equivalence, uh, the, uh, those negotiations will effectively have to see London comply with EU regulations, whether they like it or not. Uh, and there has been certainly some flexibility to some extent of the EU around that, uh, notably with respect to the clearing agencies, for example. Uh, but in the long term, it is uh, self-evident that uh, the EU is putting up, in terms of equivalence, very strong strictures in terms of third country access, including that of the UK, to the EU market. And uh, um, those changes that you just mentioned, both at EU level as well as the London level in the UK, are in your opinion reflecting broader changes in the geography of, and hierarchy most importantly, of financial centers worldwide? London has always been seen as a unique uh, financial center. Its ecosystem of banks and fund managers and, and legal uh, uh, and lawyers and consultants and so forth, built up over many, many decades, has always been viewed as a uh, competitive advantage that even when the, e the UK leaves the EU, this will still ensure that London will have a, an advantage. I don't believe that's the case. What we're seeing increasingly is as the uh, UK-based banks and f institutions and fund managers moved into Europe, they didn't move to one centre, often being seen as Frankfurt is going to be the main beneficiary of Brexit. In fact, what you can, you've seen is that there's been a multiplicity of beneficiaries. The geographic spread with some uh, institutions, uh, some firms moving to Dublin, others to Amsterdam, others to uh, Paris and Frankfurt and, 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 and Milan, has shown that when it comes down to seeking uh, a, a, a competitive position within the marketplace within the EU, it doesn't all have to be a replication in one geographic centre akin to London. Given the fact that the whole of Europe, uh, the EU, is, going to, is governed by the uh, European institutions and the ECB, it doesn't actually really matter geographically where you're located. You can, you can have that in different uh, places across Europe. And, as, and that is what we're seeing. A lot of financial institutions, including uh, the one that I worked with, have had their, uh, shifted some of their activities to Amsterdam and, and to Dublin and not to one geographic center. And this, I think, is part of a wider global phenomenon whereby financial uh, centers are growing not just uh, within Europe in terms of the spread but we're all seeing the emergence of Shanghai of Mumbai and, and after Brexit I think the diminution of London as a financial center it won't happen straight away it'll take a time but it's an irreversible project a process uh, that will uh, inevitably see uh, London's losing its significance as one of the three global financial centers. Oh, thank you very much for your time and for your okay. answers. Thank you. Thank you.